Well, there was a Christian man who owned a barbershop, and he was wanting to to grow in his faith, and one area in particular he wanted to grow in his faith was his ability to share his faith. You see, he hadn't been all that good at it for most of his Christian life, and he knew he needed to grow, so, so he was doing some extra lifting, extra work to get better at sharing his faith. He read some books, right? Uh, he, he listened to some sermons online. He, he, he went and he took a course at the local Bible college and evangelism and how to better share his faith. And so he'd done all this training, and finally he decided that the next Tuesday, he was going to start sharing his faith. And it had to be a Tuesday because he's a barber. They don't work on Mondays, right? So Tuesday, Tuesday, he's going to start sharing his faith. And wouldn't you know it, God provides a tremendous opportunity, a great opportunity to start his day off. The very first customer who walks through the door was the biggest, meanest, most foul-mouthed guy in all of the town. And you see, this guy had made a bet with his buddies and he lost. And the consequences of his losing the bet is he had to have his beard shaved off. He was a big, burly biker. That beard had been growing for years. But he was willing to live up to his part of the bet. He was ready to pay off his debt. In he came. So so the barber sees him come in, and the guy says, I need a shave, sits down in the chair, and the barber's like, okay, we'll give you a shave. And, you know, he gets out that, that cover that the barber has, right, and he throws it over him and lays him back in the chair, goes over and turns on the little foam heater, right? Because if you ever had a shave, they heat that foam up. You go to the barber, it smells great. It feels great when they shave you, right? He's over there. And, and of course, you know, barbers, they use those, those straight edge razors, right? The old fashioned style razors. And so he, he goes over and he pulls out his razor and he starts thinking about what he's going to say to this man, and he gets out his leather strap just to make sure it's nice and sharp, right? And, and he begins to just sharpen that razor, and as he's, he's sharpening that razor, he's, he's a little bit nervous, and so he begins to think over, what are the words that I want to say? What, 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 what does this man need to hear? And he begins thinking through the stuff that he's been reading and the stuff he's been listening to and learning, and, it, and, and he starts to kind of get things jumbled in his mind. In the meantime, he's, 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 he's going on that leather strap with this, with this very now sharp, 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 sharp razor and he's starting as he's thinking he's getting more and more nervous and he's going faster and faster and faster and he just knew he had to tell this guy about Jesus but the words wouldn't come and finally as he's going just at a mad pace he finally looks at the man with the razor in his hand and he screams are you prepared to die? (laughs) Now my guess is there have been many times when we knew that we should share our own personal testimony, right, about our faith in Jesus, but we too, just like the barber, were nervous, right? Or, or maybe we like the barber, we, we forgot the words that we wanted to say and the opportunity passed us by. Well, the message this morning is going to concentrate on how we can reach out to others and share our testimony. Let's use an encounter that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman to help us focus on the importance of our sharing our faith, the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at the example of Jesus as well as the example of the Samaritan woman uh, to help us uh, take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us to be able to witness for him and about him with others. So let me give you a little bit of the the background on the story out of John 9. Jesus is on his way back to Galilee, and he feels like they should go through the province of Samaria. And and when they get to this little town, a place called Sychar, uh, the disciples, they go on to find some food. Now, in the meantime, Jesus, he he goes, after the disciples kind of go in their own direction, he goes and he sits at a place called Jacob's Well. And it's there that Jesus strikes up a conversation with a Samaritan woman, a story many of us are familiar with. And this leads me to my first point of the day, a principle that we all need to understand if we are going to be effective in giving our testimony about Jesus. And it's simply this. If we are going to be effective in sharing our testimony about Jesus, each and every one of us needs to set aside our prejudices. Now, in saying this, I understand that, you know, if I were to walk up to you and go, hey, you know, are you prejudiced? Most of us go, no, no, not me, Uh uh-uh, no way. I mean, we don't readily admit we're prejudiced, right? We don't. But 
let me boldly tell you that most, if not all of us, operate at times and in certain situations out of prejudice, some more than others. And it just depends on our life experiences and all kinds of things. It doesn't explain, it doesn't make it right, but it is the reality of life. Though Jesus was a Jew, many Jews had been raised with a certain prejudice against certain people. Now, Jesus, of course, he always showed his love and his concern to people, and that's also absolutely the case when it comes to this Samaritan woman. Let's read about that in uh, John 4, verses 7 through 9. It says, as Jesus is sitting at the well, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, this is, you know, the prejudice coming into play, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? And then it says in our Bibles, For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. You see, when, when Jesus speaks to this woman at the well, she was surprised that he, he even says boodori. She's surprised he says any word whatsoever. And there are some reasons for this. First of all, she is a Samaritan. John includes for us this reason for this woman's question to Jesus. She says, hey, why are you talking to me? Jews, they don't have anything to do with us, right? You see, the problem with the Samaritans, if you don't know, the Samaritans were considered by the Jews to be half-breeds, literally. They, they, were, they were Jews who had intermarried with the people of that particular region. These people had been brought in by the king of Assyria during one of the exiles of the nation of Israel. And so because of that, because they were foreigners living in their midst, they were people living on the chosen people's land. They weren't supposed to be here. And then we weren't supposed to marry them. And we weren't supposed to continue living with them. Because of that, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And not only that, the feelings were mutual. It was a two-way street. So in other words, there was a, a lot of prejudice and animosity and bad attitudes between the Jews and the Samaritans. And next, and possibly even more important to this part of the story, is simply that she was a woman. It was not proper, particularly for a man of Jesus' status. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. It's not proper for him to be sitting there talking to this lady. And not only was she a woman, but she was a sinner. This wasn't just any woman. She had a history, a closet full of skeletons. So she's Samaritan, woman, sinner. One, two, three strikes and you're out, right? Not with Jesus. And hopefully, not with us. And I would urge you to remember these three principles when it comes to putting aside your prejudices. First, simply, we need to remember that it's not, the, it's not in any way about the color of skin, but it's about the color of blood. Jesus' blood. It's not about your gender, but it's about your image. We were created in the image of God. Jesus shed his blood for us. And I can't find anything as I read through the scriptures that says he only shed it for Americans or he only shed it for Israelites, right? The Bible said that God so loved the world, right? Not God so loved this group or that group. And last I checked, the world included all of the continents and all the people regardless of race, color, creed. We all bleed red, and so did Jesus. And along with that, in first, in Genesis uh, 1, 28, it says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, both male and female. He created them. 
We are made literally in the image of God. Not that, you know, God doesn't look like me. Even if he did, I bet he'd be a skinnier version of me. Right? With better teeth. He wouldn't have bad teeth. Wouldn't have a bad knee. No, that's not what it is. But we were created in the image of God. Regardless of where we live or who we are. Regardless of gender, age, lifestyle, or religion, we were created in the image of God. We are image bearers of Yahweh. And no person on this planet is worthy of the grace of God that God showed through when Jesus died on Calvary's cross. But every person is worthy enough in God's eyes to be shown his love and his salvation. Jesus said in in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. People of all races, of all lifestyles, of all colors, of all creeds, of all locations need Jesus. Nobody is exempt from that. The issue is not from where people come from. The issue is not how people dress. The issue is that they need to know and love Jesus just like you and me. Because you see, this is so important for us to understand. People don't get cleaned up before they come to the cross. That's not how it works, folks. We have to love them first and then let God work and change and transform them. So love others. Put aside our prejudices. For some of us, it's where they grew up in town. For some of us, well, oh yeah, they're Germans, right? Sounds weird, but we're Swedish Baptists. There was a time when you didn't mingle with the German Catholics, right? There was a time where this pocket of people didn't mix with those pocket of people, even though they all love Jesus. There is prejudice. It does exist. So love others and put that aside. And along with that, as we do that, we do need to speak the truth. But always speaking the truth in love. Let's go back to that story in John 4. Now as Jesus is speaking to the woman, you'll see he challenged her with something that he called the living water, right? And he he tells this woman, he says, hey, if, if you drink of this living water, if you drink of that water, you will never thirst again. And she responds, I'd like some of that water. But she didn't quite understand what it was that Jesus meant. Let's pick it up in verse 15. It says, The woman says to him, Sir, give me that water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and tell him to come here. I can imagine her kind of putting her head down. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus was looking at her, I'm sure, with those piercing eyes that only Jesus could have. And he said to her, you answered correctly when you said you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one with whom you're living right now, He's not your husband. This I have said truly. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Can you see what Jesus is doing here? He's trying to help this woman see her need for the living water. That's what he's talking to her about. He's told her about it, but she doesn't understand it. She doesn't get it. Because the problem is, we don't change until we see the need for change. She's thinking, yeah, living water, give me some of that. Sounds easy solution to my problems. Fixed, right? But she didn't understand. And from what Jesus said and did here, we can learn some tips for telling the truth in love. First, never apologize for the truth. As I read through the gospel accounts, the gospel records, I have yet to find one single time where Jesus apologized for telling anyone the truth. Yet, for whatever reason, it seems like 
there are people who, who try to make us feel like we need to apologize for sharing Jesus. Well, let me tell you something, though. The Muslims aren't going to apologize for sharing Muhammad and Allah. You ever heard that? You ever had a Mormon come to your door and knock and apologize for trying to tell you about their false gods? You ever had a Jehovah's Witness tell you, I'm sorry, we've corrupted the Bible, and I'm sorry, I have to give you this watchtower tract. They ever apologize for that stuff with you? Not with me. And yet, some of us agonize about sharing our faith. We have nothing to apologize for when we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the word gospel itself is the good news. We have no reason to apologize for sharing it because it is the, the, the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes it. Let me say that again, in case you missed it. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who needs it. For everyone who will believe. If anything, we need to apologize for not bringing the gospel sooner. I mean, if the Bible's right, and it is, then we have the news that people need in order to avoid going to hell, in order to enjoy forgiveness and reconciliation with God. It's the news that people need to hear to live life and to live life in full in God's abundance. Anybody you know doesn't need that? Let me encourage you. Please. Do not apologize for sharing good news. But like Jesus, do it in love. Second, don't ignore sin that needs to be addressed. Why is that important? Well, very simply, because before anyone can be saved, they need to recognize they are lost. Right? One of my, one of my jobs... Back when I was in college, I, I worked for the Boy Scouts of America for three summers in New Mexico, teaching people how to backpack through the Rocky Mountains. This was pre-GPS days. Yes, I am that old. And so I had to teach people map and compass and how to triangulate and things like that. And I would be with them for a couple of days, and then I would set them free to go on a trek all on their own for the next 10 days hoping that I had done enough to teach them along the way or they had learned before they even met me how to read a map. Occasionally, and, and one of the policies was we always hiked at the back, occasionally I would be with my crew and I would see they were taking the wrong path. I knew it. I mean, I knew the, I knew the trails quite well. But even if I didn't, I knew how to read a map. But I can't say anything. This is one of those learn-as-you-go kind of experiences in life, right? So, you know, I'd been working in the Rocky Mountains all summer. I was hiking all summer. I was in good shape. It was just an extra walk in the woods for me. It was beautiful. I didn't mind a few extra miles. But eventually, they would come to a place where somebody would speak up and go, Hey, hold on a second here. We shouldn't be at this crossroads, or we shouldn't be at this camp, or we shouldn't be climbing a mountain when we should be going downhill. But they didn't know they were lost up until that very point. They didn't know they had a need until they realized they were lost. That is how it works. And so Jesus needed to make sure that this woman understood the error of her ways before she could see why she needed the living water. Jesus couldn't have given this woman the water of life until she had a thirst for it. When he says, I have this living water, and she says, oh yeah, I'd like that, she has no idea what she's saying. So he tries to make her thirsty by pointing out to her the struggles with all of the men in her life. We don't know why she had had five husbands, I mean, maybe she was looking for that one man who would fulfill her life, who would give her everything that she ever would want, that would make her completely happy, right? 
Maybe she was just looking for a quick fix. Many men and women today, just like that, looking for a quick fix in a relationship. Something that fixes, so to speak, their loneliness. Something that dissolves away the lack of self-esteem. We look in many places, but we always will come up empty unless we look and recognize that the one who gave us that desire is the only one who could fulfill that desire, and that is God. The answer to our inner thirst is a complete surrender to God. The woman at the well had been, so to speak, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. Remember that song? I shouldn't sing, should I? One quick fix after another. And the reality is, there isn't a perfect man or there isn't a a perfect woman who can fix our lives that are broken. No more could any of those men, five husbands now living with another man. No longer could they fix her problems, fix her life. See, she would have been ashamed of her history. In small towns like this, everyone knows, right? Everyone knows how many men she's been with, how many husbands she had. Everyone knows, nah, she's living with some other guy now. It's not even her husband anymore, right? She wouldn't have been your normal candidate for salvation. At least in some people's eyes. But you see, Jesus always looks deeper. He gets below the surface. He, he, he sees in that deep searching of her heart that despite all these attempts, she was still unsatisfied. And so he addressed in a loving way the sin issue in her life, or at least one of the sin issues in her life. And then he spoke to her in truth about who it was that he was. If someone is living in a sinful lifestyle, they need to know that, not just that it's sinful, but that Jesus offers them freedom from that way of life. People need to know that they are lost before they can be saved. But like Jesus, we too need to address that issue in love, realizing that we too, all of us, have dealt with sin issues. And in fact, we too, all of us, are still dealing with sin issues. And that leads me to the next point about sharing the truth in love. As we share the truth in love, we need to keep our noses down and not up. Right? You know what I'm talking about? In other words, you don't get to walk around like yours doesn't stink. I don't sin. I don't do that. I don't have those problems. I'm better than you. Right? Do we do that? Oh, yes, we do. We look at people, where they live, how they live. One of the ways I do it, I'll I'll be honest, when I hear people talk. I'm well-educated, well-read, and I'll hear somebody say something, and sometimes as a pastor it's wildly inappropriate things, because they don't know I'm a pastor. It's one of the great things about being a pastor people find out you're a pastor, they quit talking. (laughs) Quickest way to shut conversation down at a bar is go sit down and tell somebody you're a pastor. So if you're ever caught in a situation where somebody's talking to you and you're at the bar and no Baptists ever go to the bar, but just in case, and you want that conversation to end, just go, I'm a pastor. So I heard my name over here. Somebody's calling. Right? That's not always true, but somewhat true. But we need to keep our nose down or not up. We can't stick our noses up in the air if we want to love people like Jesus loved people. We can't look down on others with an air of superiority. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. Back to the story in John 4. Jesus had just told this woman that, that he was the Messiah, that she had been reading or at least hearing about was going to come. Look at verse 27. Jesus is sitting there having this conversation with this woman and it says at this point his disciples came and they were amazed 
that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet, no one said, What do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? The implication here is that they wanted to ask, but they didn't. You can, you can almost imagine what his disciples are thinking. They're, 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 they're walking up on this setting and, and they're, they're going, why are you talking with this woman for crying out loud? I mean, not, not only is she a woman, but she's a Samaritan woman. Why are you talking with this lady? I mean, and if they had known about her history, they couldn't have, but had they known what kind of lady this was, those disciples would have walked by like, why are you talking with her, Jesus? And the Pharisees, oh, ho, 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 they would have had a heyday had they caught Jesus talking with this woman. But let me say this as nicely as I can. You are no better than anyone else, and neither am I. We might be better off because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, but we are no better than anybody else. So keep your nose down, not up. And so far we've learned that if we're going to share our testimony about Jesus, and we've been called to do exactly that, we have to set aside our prejudices. We have to speak the truth in love. And then finally, we need to be available and ready at all times. Look at verses 28 and 29. It says, so, Jesus, so the woman left her water pot and she went into the city and said to the men, come, see this man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? See, the woman had come to the well to get some water, but notice that John says that she had left her water pot and went into the city. We don't know why she leaves this water pot behind. Maybe she's going to come back later and fill it back up. But I believe we can safely say that this woman now had something far more important than carrying this water back home. She had been changed, transformed completely. And now her first priority was to go and tell others about Jesus. The transformation in her life must have absolutely been amazing because many, it says in the Bible, many came to see and hear Jesus because of her witness. In verse 39 we read, From that city many of the, many of the Samaritans believed in Jesus because of the word of this woman who testified, He told me all of the things that I've done. You see, being a witness for Jesus is not a complicated thing. Being a witness for Jesus is simply telling and showing others about what it is that you found. Because of this woman's testimony, many Samaritans believed and followed Jesus. Look at verses 40 through 42. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed with them there for two days. Many more believed because of his word. 42, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it now for ourselves, and we know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. No second-hand experience was, was going to do it for them any longer. They had found the Savior. They had personally found Jesus. No longer was it simply because of what she said, but because we have heard him ourselves. This is how it works. You share your testimony, and as you share your testimony, others will check it out by going to God's word and finding out for themselves. So pray. Pray for opportunities for you to share your testimony, to share your faith. This is something that I know personally. You may not know the Bible forwards and backwards. You might not have gone to seminary like me for four years. You might not even be the most well-spoken person. You might not even be the smartest person. That's okay. Can you tell a story? Every one of us can tell a story, especially when it's our story. 
So begin to pray for opportunities for you to share your story of how Jesus saved you. Pray for those opportunities, folks. Who in your life needs to know Jesus? Identify them and start praying for them. Pray that God would open their hearts to the good news of Christ. And then here's the hardest part. Pray that God would allow you an opportunity to share Jesus with those people. My last point as I wrap this up today is simply this. We as a church need to be a people who welcome others into our church fellowship. And here's what I need, here's what I I mean by that. While it's true that a, a person must be saved before God will add them to the church, to his family, they do not have to be saved in order to be invited to come and share with the wonderful fellowship as we assemble together. Now, it used to be that people would just come to church just because the doors were open, right? That's the way it used to be. But it doesn't work that way anymore. People need to be invited. If we want people to come, it takes a little personal risk, stepping out in faith, praying for people and taking chances. We have to invite our friends, family, and neighbors, or they just won't come. People need to be invited to church to see that we do indeed still have something to offer. The purpose of sharing the love of Christ and the word of God is to change lives. The Bible doesn't exist just to simply tell us about God. It exists to transform us, to become more and more like Jesus, becoming more and more Christ-like each and every day. And when people are being transformed by the Word of God, it's easy then to invite others. And it's easy for people to see that we have something to offer. But they need to be invited. Invited to come just as they are. Jesus could have just left the woman at the well just just hanging, right? With the knowledge that he knew who she was. He could have said, yeah, I know who you are. You're a sinner. Five husbands living with another guy. He could have left her dwelling in her shame. Could have left her struggling with that identity. Could have left her with a hurting and broken heart. He knew her sinfulness. But he went on to say that he was the Messiah. And then after the townspeople came out to see this guy, he stuck around for a few days so that then a bunch more put their faith in him. Oftentimes people say, Pastor, I can't share my faith. I wouldn't know what to say. There's no special magical words. Look at this woman. How much of the Bible do you think she had read? I mean, she didn't even have the New Testament. But probably none. She was likely not even able to read. And having had five husbands, living with a man who wasn't her husband, being in Samaria, she didn't spend a whole lot of time at the temple, I suspect. But she could tell a story. She ran into town and she told the people, you'll never believe it. This guy knew me. You need to go meet him. It didn't take deep theological training. It didn't take special words. She probably didn't know anything at all about the scripture. She just simply shared what she knew. What makes people listen to you? People will listen when they see that your life has been changed. Let me end today with an illustration that tells us in a a small way, a somewhat humorous way, that testimony is incredibly important. There was a, a woman on a beach in Florida soaking up the sun's rays. And she was sitting there just on vacation enjoying, I'm not in Minnesota, it's warm. 
And as she was sitting there enjoying the sun shining down upon her and listening to the waves crash and just really finally relaxing for the first time in quite some time, this little boy comes walking up. He's wearing his swimming trunks and he's, he's carrying a towel. And he comes up to her and he stands there. And of course, as little boys tend to do, he stands right in her sunlight, right? If he was standing anywhere else, she might be able to ignore him. But that shadow was right over her face. She's sitting there for a minute thinking maybe he'll go away. Nope. Opens her eyes, sees the little boy, sees his towel over his arm, looks at him and says, Can I help you? The little boy looks at her and he says, Do you believe in God? She was a little taken aback and surprised by this question, but she replied, well, Yeah? Why? And he looked at her a little closer and he kind of leaned in with his little nose, getting a little closer to her. He said, do you go to church every Sunday? Again, she looked at him. Yeah, I, I do. And he said, do you read your Bible and pray every day? And again, she said yes. And, and, and by now her curiosity was very much aroused. I mean, the lady was kind of proud of this little guy and sighed with relief and was thinking... Oh, good, you know, this is a neat little boy. And he looks at her and he says, Then would you hold my dollar while I go swimming? <laughs> you see, the little boy needed to hear a little bit about her testimony before he would trust this lady with that all-important dollar. While I understand that our testimony must be backed up with the way that we live, it is often our own personal testimony that challenges people to think about their own way of living. So my friends, let us put aside all of our prejudices. Let us speak the truth in love. And let us be ready at all times to share about the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray.